But who you're meeting are, is a group of pirates and vandals. And pirates and vandals don't go with cheerleading and they're gonna second guess everything you tell them. That's just their nature. So how do you get a team of pirates to behave like a Navy is really what's at stake here. How do you do that? Welcome to Real Creative Leadership, a place where creative leaders can find insights and practical guidance on the day-to-day -day job of being a creative leader. We focus on real issues, topics, and insights of creativity in the business world. Join me as we explore the best strategies for developing your team, getting others to embrace your vision, and generating amazing experiences. This webinar series is produced by The Stoke Group, and I'm your host, Adam Morgan, Adobe Executive Creative Director and author of Sorry Spock, Emotions Drive Business. And this is Real Creative Leadership. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Real Creative Leadership. Our topic today is how to lead your team and get them to do their very best work. And we've got a legend of advertising here to help us understand this topic, and I'm super, super excited. Yes, yes, legend. You can shake your head, Luke, all you want, but in my mind, you are. Um, let me give you a little background. After 33 years in the ad business at elite agencies like Fallon Worldwide and the Martin Agency, Luke became the, uh, the chair of the advertising department at the Savannah College of Art and Design for 10 years. He's the author of the book, Hey Whipple, Squeeze This, The Classic Guide to Creating Great Advertising. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later. And then he's got a blog, heywhipple.com. Right now, he's a consultant, lives in Savannah with his family. Luke, welcome to Real Creative Leadership. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, man. That was just my little blurb on, on who you are, your background. But maybe if you'd like to give us a start of like your relationship with creativity and your perspective on it, where you're going, maybe some history, whatever you want to give us. Well, I coach my students. So they're, when they're in their interview, they should not be uh, they should not be quiet about this part. Uh, typically, in interviews... We, we adopt the thing that we were, most people are raised not to talk about themselves, yep. right? Not to brag about themselves. And it always feels a little weird when you sell yourself, but um, you have to get good at that. You have to be able to tell somebody who's going to hire you, well, here's why you should hire me. So if I'm going to talk about myself, um, I've been writing my entire life. Uh, I remember, I still have the stuff I wrote in third grade and one, and one thing at the elementary school. I wrote for the high school paper. I wrote for my college paper. Uh, it's what I enjoy doing more than anything else, except maybe reading. Um, I also got into doing cartoons. And then after, after college, I continued to write for alternative weeklies and a, a, a regional music uh, publication, writing, writing, writing. Uh, it took me a long time to turn my degree, bachelor's arts in, uh, for psychology, <laughs> into a paying gig. Um, uh, and I actually never did. I simply had to figure out how am I going to get into this advertising business. I studied the work of uh, two local geniuses, uh, Tom McGilliott and Ron Anderson. They were um, credited for basically sparking the outside of New York advertising can be good, uh, uh, you know, growth in the 80s. Um, they were my first bosses, and, and I owe everything I am to them. Uh, I w went from there to I did one miserable year in New York City. <laughs> Um, I'm just not a, I'm just not a New York person. I just want to push everything back about six feet. Just get back. Too much for me. Uh, then I went to the Martin Agency. Five of the best years of my career. Just loved it. Mike Hughes was the, was the guy then. And then I, uh, went to Fallon for 10 years. And then, uh, I, I decided to sell out. You get to sell out once. And, um, I was hired by a, very, very bad agency. His name will remain unmentioned. Um, and I was there for five years, and I was killed in a palace coup. <laughs> uh, two people. Let's hear about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, you know, you just sit there, and suddenly you go, Wah! and you turn around, and you're back. What's that? What's that? It's a knife. What? And I was killed in a palace coup by two people who I really, really quite liked until then. Um, and so, uh, Wendy, uh, Wendy. Um, Ludlow Clark was one of my clients back then, the Wendy Clark, the CEO of um, Ditsu now. Um, and she said, come down to where she was at gsd &M in mm -hmm. Austin. So I had the, the last eight years of my career were at gsd &M in Austin, a wonderful place. Um, and then I went to teach for 10 years uh, uh, at the SCAD, and now I'm kind of done. Well, that's awesome. Well, I have to say, backing up, I know you said there were some people who were pivotal in your career. 
And I'll just have to say, oh, for yeah. you were one that I owe some gratitude to oh. because I remember, I don't know when it was, 94, 95, somewhere around there, when I got a hold of your book, Hey Whipple, and it just really solidified my dream to become an advertising copywriter. And, you know, that's where I started that's off. Great. And, you know, there were a lot of great insights and it just seemed like such an exciting if I toot my own horn, If I toot my own horn, I'll say, I made it sound fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are just moments of kicking your kicking back and putting your feet up on a table and talking with your art director, or writer, partner. You know, that's what it was. I mean, you you captured the majesty of of that yeah. era of my life for sure. Well, that's great. I'm so glad you liked it. Well, cool. Well, anyhow, let, let's tell us. Like, so now, I mean, this is a book that, um, like I said, I read it way back in the day, but now you're in the sixth version, sixth ed- sixth edition. Um, yep. Just kicking it off, or is it already out there? Tell yeah. us more about that. Well, the first, the first one actually came out in 1998, so you're getting old, too. Oh. Ah, I it was 98 movie. when I first read it. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, 98. And I look back in that edition, yeah, it's I, I just I, – I don't cringe because it still was one of the better books out, even at that oh, yeah. time. But um, I figured a whole heck of a lot out since then, uh, and not by being brilliant, but just by listening and studying and being curious. Uh, and, uh, I, it took all of, it takes generally about a year and a half to revise one of those things. Uh, partly because I write, write the whole thing anyway. I just keep seeing things to improve as any writer does when they look at their own work. And, uh, I have to update all the work too. I just don't want to have, you know, last year's, uh, um, case histories as examples, a few classics I keep. Um, but then in addition to uh, just updating and rewriting, uh, there's whole new, whole new things to start talking about. I mean, I had to add, start talking about social media Mm -hmm. in the fourth edition. I decided I would bring in a co-author, Edward Bochus, in the fifth edition, uh, because uh, while I was keeping up, I thought pretty well, I wanted to bring in somebody with some real chops. And so Edward really made the fifth edition what what it is. But I had to add entire new sections on uh, on social media. I had two great interviews with people uh, like um, Andrew Keller from Mm -hmm. Princeton. Remember that name? Mm -hmm. Know, when they were radioactive, he's now at Facebook, and so I had a good interview with him, and as well as, well as another guy from Facebook who's down in uh, Auckland, um, uh, Andy Blood. Uh, these guys t- really opened my eyes about social, uh, about social media, and about how about about constructing campaign architecture in the social media space. I had an entire section on what. Some people call creative technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, some call it user experience, UX, whatever. Um, uh, that some of that stuff I learned from my own students. I've had a couple of pretty smart students who said, uh, "Dude, you've got to have this in there," and they were right. Um, and then I added, I, I improved the copywriting chapter vastly. I put off really writing the copywriting chapter, rewriting it because I did that for thirty-four years. And I never thought that I could actually teach a class in just copywriting with just 10 weeks. I just thought, there's no way I can put it in there. There's no way I can put it in a book. But I finally decided, to screw it, you have to do that. And so I vastly improved the copywriting chapter and then vastly improved the very last chapter, uh, which is called Starting World War III, uh, What It Takes to Get Into the Business. Hmm. Well, and now, I mean, the fact that we're talking here is not just about the book, but um, you've been moving on to a new topic because a lot of what the book was about was getting into the business and the day-to-day and kind of getting going. But now you are moving on to more of a focus on creative directors and how do we help creative directors improve and how do we help them learn the right skills? And I think there's a big um, appetite out there for a lot of people to, to do that. Yes, now that I'm a consultant, that's one of the things that uh, that I can help agencies with. Uh, my old boss, Mike Hughes, uh, rest in peace, uh, told me that just being a good creative doesn't qualify you to be a good creative director. Nope. It just doesn't. Uh, I know some brilliant creatives who can think rings around me, but um, they really they just have no no sense for managing people. Some of the soft and tangible skills that are part of being a creative director that are vitally important, especially if you're leading teams and brands. Uh, So um, I did a lot of, a lot of research that this, for this one presentation that I give, um, it was a good year and a half of work just on basically one chapter, uh, if if I may. 
uh, reading Todd Henry and, and many other uh, uh, good books on 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 managing creatives. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of, one of the first things that I, I noticed, I, I, I say to people who are trying to get good at this, think back and remember what you were like as a young creative. Let's just start with that. What were you like? Now, I can only tell you what I was like, uh, but I was a pain in the ass. Um, I was all, all, all energy and no direction. Uh, I was full of opinions. Uh, this sucks and that sucks. Um, uh, and more than anything, I was a cynic. Mm-hmm. I was a cynic. Uh, here's the thing, though. I think most creatives are like me. I think there are some nice kind of uh, people who have different lives than I did who don't have this ruthless cynicism at their heart. But I think most creatives do. I think most creatives are, are vandals. The really good ones are vandals. They're nose wrinklers. They're eye rollers. Mm-hmm. And I think that's good because when you have cynics on your staff, number one, you're trying to create work that's going to be seen by a nation that is full of eye rollers as well. Everybody's, everybody's so skeptical about everything. So how do you get a brand to show up in this, 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 this world of people who don't believe shit? How do you do that? Uh, so creatives with a, with a high dose of cynicism in their soul are really good um, bullshit detectives, uh, and they'll they'll call bullshit on a on a, on a brief that's kind of trying to cheerlead its way into making some claim. They'll they're more authentic uh, uh, than somebody who's just takes their orders from the creative director. We have to say this is the best flight you'll ever have. Well, it's not. I don't care what brand of airline you're talking about. It's not going to be perfect. It's flying, and flying sucks. So that's how creative I think the crowd creative I would want to hire. Thinks. Uh, I remember working on United Airlines back at Fallon, and uh, the hallway brief was basically flying sucks, but it sucks less here. That's an authentic sort of approach uh, that allowed us to, I think, write and create advertising that didn't look like clueless cheerleading. So that's one of the first things I suggest uh, uh, is to look at who you're leading. Who you're leading are, is a group of pirates and vandals. And pirates and vandals don't go with cheerleading. And they're going to second guess everything you tell them. That's just their nature. It's their nature. So how do you get a team of pirates to behave like a Navy? Is really what's, what's at stake here. How do you do that? Well, you've also mentioned that there's the way that we used to manage people has changed. Like the, the way the role of the creative director, the way they used to do it, the brutal CD. Like, tell us more about that and how that's changing. Over oh, my time. God. My God. I fortunately never had a brutal CD. If I had, that sparks would have really flown mm. because uh, I didn't, I wouldn't have taken that even as a clueless young kid. But they are out there. They are out there. And uh, I imagine they've, they've gone down in number a little bit. But I think during the 80s and 90s, they probably were at their high water yeah, mark yeah. Uh, when the salaries are starting to explode up there. And it's kind of like the uh, tour uh, director sort of syndrome, where if you have one hit, you know, and suddenly Hollywood's giving you tons of money and you just think, you know, well, everything I think is great. I did my own vest pocket research for uh, a presentation on being a creative director. Uh, and I asked all my followers on Facebook to do this poll. And I, I put up four different kinds of creative directors that you've worked with. Uh, which ones uh, were the worst? And um, the one that got 37% of people saying, wow, well, that's the worst. I called it the person who's working out their childhood issues in the creative department. <laughs> Somebody who's, because that's what they're doing. What they're doing is they're working out issues from their childhood uh, and abusing people and uh, 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 swinging their power around. Uh, and they last, uh, I'm amazed that they, they can last as long as they do. The reason why brutal creative directors can last as long as they do in a job is the same reason that we forgive uh, misbehavior uh, of rock stars. Um, but we forgive uh, crazy behavior from sort of creative people. They don't last. They just, they're not sustainable. They're going to burn out their troops. The troops will leave to go with somebody who they Maybe they respect this brutal creative director and say, yes, he did great work, but it's not sustainable because they don't respect him as a person. 
So I just think it's out. Schmucks like that are out. No, I totally agree. I, I've seen, I mean, I think just the, everything from me too, and so many other trends that are finally yeah. helping out that it's just like, we just, we're not tolerating mm-hmm. crazy rock stars as much. So that's, that's yep. a good trend. Yep, that's a, that is a good thing. Well, maybe let's dig into it then. So you've done all this research. Let's talk about what are the qualities of a great creative leader that, uh, from your perspective, I would love to just hear as we go through a couple of them and you could just give us some good context well, on them. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's talk again about what, remember you yourself as a young creative, what would you have liked, which is, I think, the, what a creative director, a good creative director should imagine. Uh, it doesn't mean to kowtow to yourself as mm-hmm. when you were a young creative person who's probably all messed up like I was. But if, if I think back, the things that bothered me most, I wish that I could change if I could run this place, it would have been um, clueless and timid clients, clueless and timid or brutal creative directors, and boring or clueless briefs. Those are generally the big three that you have to kind of juggle in a creative environment. That, that's all in the book, but those are the things that I, that I continue to lecture on today. Mm-hmm. Because uh, that's the, that's what creative people out there are thinking. If you could overhear them, and many times we can, whether you see it on their Slack or you hear it, you hear it about it, you hear them complaining in the break room. Uh, they're out there complaining. They have opinions, and uh, uh, it's it's worthwhile to listen because it will make you a better leader if you know what they're thinking, even if what they're thinking is stupid or crap or misguided. Yeah. Right. One of the things that I didn't like as a junior creative, and I still don't like to this day, is meetings. Meetings. Meetings are time sucks. People, creative people get into this business to create, to create. But um, so much of our time uh, in the business is spent in meetings where we're talking about creating, but we're not creating. That's just, uh, to me, the meeting is the creative's ninth circle of Dante's hell. (laughs) To be in a meeting when you'd rather be creating. And my guess is that most meetings, uh, 90% of them are needed. Um, if you have a good strategist and a good account team and they work well with the client, you come up with a sort of a direction and you hand that off to the creative teams and you give them a deadline uh, and some parameters and you go. You know, so my, my first piece of advice is fewer meetings, more conversations in the hallway. Creators will love you for that. Yeah, there are a lot of companies that are putting out models of like, you know, if you can solve it in an email, if you can solve it in a Slack, if you can solve it in a hallway conversation, that's always preferred and better than a big long mm-hmm. pomp and circumstance of a meeting. Okay, so besides transparency, what else? You talked about red tape, removing red tape. Well, authenticity is the is the word I use, and it's it, it's because everybody's an eye roller, including cus- consumers, people out there in the world, and especially creative people. Authentic leadership is key. One of the things that makes a leader authentic is vulnerability. Hmm. Vulnerability. I just read this thing from um, uh, Jeff Goodby, where uh, in some interview, and he basically said, I, I like to have a kind of a department where uh, all the creatives feel free to make fun of me, right to my face. Right to my face, because there's a lot of truth in that. That means being vulnerable means t- taking one and sometimes giving one. It means being in the scrum with them and not some person uh, on a different floor who everybody's afraid of. And once I became a credit director, I had a thing called the, the wall of disrespect. And I just encouraged everybody to put pictures, uh, make fun of me and pin it up outside my office. Hmm. I mean, it, it, was, it was given physical space. And it was delightful. People, there was no, there was no eggshells around. There was no, oh God, I'm going to see that. It, it was brutal. That is more than just I'm one of you. That is being there in the kitchen complaining as well. A lot of this stuff in this agency sucks. Some of our clients suck. Some of, sometimes I suck. It's this ability to be authentic and not be a cheerleader is so. So important. I, and I think a lot of people, especially people who aren't, haven't had much management experience with people, think that they can just sort of, um, uh, with a deep voice and a, and a good vision, here's how it works. Uh, 
oh, there's so many intangibles of leading these people who are eye rollers to get them on this, on the same side as you and get them pointed in the same direction with the same vision uh, and um, some hope in their heart. All right. What's another? What are, you had several uh, qualities. So we talked about authenticity. What are other leadership yeah, yeah, yeah. attributes? Authenticity. You know what it connects to? Now, remember, and you were right, you mentioned transparency. Authenticity requires transparency because if I'm really being authentic, I can't hide some stuff behind the, oh, that's not for you creatives to mm. see. If I'm being authentic, I'm out there and I'm vulnerable. I'm, I'm giving you everything I've got. Uh, transparency is one of them. And, and radical transparency is the way I actually put it. Uh, and there's a new book out called Radical Candor, yep. which has some really good Scott. points in mm-hmm. it. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, this is uh, along those lines. Uh, pretty much be candid about everything, transparent about everything, but maybe salaries. Uh, other people will say no, make that transparent too. It's a different conversation. Let's say um, we have a, a we have a famously bad client at this agency, but they are we got them a long time ago. They're grandfathered in. They're keeping half the lights on. Uh, if we lose them, we're going to have to we're going to have to lose you know a third of the creative department. So this is one of those big clients that occasionally wakes up from a slumber and asks everybody on a fire drill to do something really terrible, some terrible brief or some terrible idea. I would trust a creative director who says what we're about to do is terrible. I don't agree with it. It's really, it's really bad to, to, to say, yeah, I know guys, listen, we're going to be in here uh, Saturdays and Sundays for probably the next, for the next month. This is going to suck. Uh, here's why we're going to be in here for the next month. And you go through what I just said. Well, this is a big client. We've done good work in them before, but every once in a while, they just ask us to do crap. Uh, I think I'd like to keep this client. I think we should. I wouldn't want to lose a third of you or whatever the numbers are. Uh, I think that if we can, and the, and the metaphor I use is, um, I don't know if you ever saw the version of uh, Chernobyl on HBO. Mm. But there's a, there's a really good book on the two midnight at Chernobyl. And when that thing first blew up, uh, the first thing, the triage unit, the most important thing they had to do was to get the most venomously radioactive material off the roof of a nearby building from where it exploded. But it was so bad, this stuff, that they they brought in um, uh, Russian volunteers, voluntolds, who, who, but they didn't let them be up there for more than 45 seconds. You, they put on these really kind of poorly made lead suits and they had a shovel and they ran out onto the roof and they shoveled, shoveled, shoveled for 45 seconds and they left the whole place and never came back. That's what I would say to a student who, or a junior's having to work on some piece of shit, is grab a shovel. <laughs> it'll end soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'll end. Uh, grab a shovel. Um, I've done my share of shoveling. Uh, it'll be over soon. Uh, if this continues with this client, well, then we're going to renegotiate and see because we can't do this over and over. It's not sustainable. But if it's a one-off, well, I would be transparent and let your let you let your people know. There's this amazing thing. Bad creative directors tell people how you know. Oh, no, I don't you do it like that. Do it like this. A good one tells people why. Here's why we're doing this. You know. Uh, not just handing you the marching orders. Okay, go work on some radio, and I want you to do the Twitter feed. Well, why are we doing Twitter? Why is the radio? You'd be surprised how much torture we creative people will take if we're told if we know why we're being tortured. And is that really that's your way of motivating them? Like just by telling them the why? That's how do you get them motivated? I'm convinced. I know from my own experience that telling them. Telling them authentically. Now, sometimes you don't have to complain about the client and you can motivate them. Any good creative person handed a decent brief for a, for a decent client. Uh, to me, the motivation is built yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. And if they're not motivated with that, uh, I may have made a mistake in hiring. But most advertising, I don't think, is a, a great client with a great brief. It's just not. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, not a, it's not a bad client. It's, just, it's a good client. But the, but the job is just kind of something... Um, Hey, you, I, I want you to work this weekend and next weekend on doing all the banners. Mm. Like, I want the banners to be better. You know, it's hard. It's hard for some people to get up about that. You can start to, you can start to number one, sell them that the banners can be more than just a banner. Uh, banners are you know, yay big, but they're this deep, you know, mm-hmm. they're dynamic. And you can, you can, you can uh, encourage them. 
uh, that way. Generally, I think the most important counseling that we do as creative directors, most important encouragement we give is when things are tough. Hmm. When things are tough. When client is killed, something I had a campaign killed 13 times once. And, you know, going back up on that roof, it gets tough. And they need encouragement, which is, um, it's interesting. The word means to give courage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Courage. The courage to really try, try hard, even though you know it may not probably sell, even though you don't even like these people you're trying to do it for, even though you may disagree with the brief. It takes courage to just put yourself on a shelf and just grab your sharpest pencil and go in there and try to kick ass. That's courage. You talked a little bit about <clears throat> how to encourage them and give them courage when it's a tough situation. I love that. What are things that demotivate creative teams? Oh, those are pretty easy. I don't. I just thought. I just thought of um, one more thing in the last okay. question. You, you asked telling was telling people why really that important. And there's this old saying, and it may be biblical. I don't know where it comes <laughs> from. Uh, you know what I'm going with. No, on this keep going. It's, 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 yeah, it's it's quite it's quite beautiful. And uh, it was, this is so apocryphal. Even if this didn't happen, it should happen. It's so cool. So the wise man's walking along the road, uh, uh, you know, and, and he sees a laborer, a peasant laborer on the side, working on the side of the, of the road. Looks like he's building something. And, and, and he asks him, what are you doing? And this, this person who's just uh, says, I'm laying bricks. Doesn't look that happy. He's laying bricks, blah, blah, blah comes upon another person who eh, seems to be uh, a little more happy with his job. He's, and he asks him, what are, you, what are you doing? What do you do? And he says, I'm building a wall. Well, and now he knows what he's part of, and he can see the end of this job, and, and he knows what, why it's needed. And the last one, when he asks this person who's just for the job, is what are you doing? And, and, and he said, I'm building a cathedral to God. When you tell people why, and if you can get them excited about the possibilities <clears throat> for a client that even heretofore has not really proven itself to be creatively driven, when you can get your team believing, believing that it is possible, uh, that's one. And the last thing I'm going to say before we move on is this comes from basketball. Uh, if coach's first responsibility is to love his team, to love now, I know plenty of great creative directors, uh, say David at uh, BBDO, uh, David, um, I can't remember the, the head of BBDO creative. Uh, he probably can't get to know everybody there. He's a chief creative officer of a huge multi-level organization. Uh, I was never in that position, but I did lead many teams. They know if you give a <laughs> My students knew that I loved them, and I told my students that. And I would stay late for them, and I would I, I would I would cry with them, and I would feel bad with them, and I was shoulder to shoulder with these students, uh, and I know I was loved. I know it because I love them. It matters to love your team. If you can't, I don't know what to tell you. So anyway. I love that. I literally love that. Oh, there was something else. I saw some article recently of like what, you know, and this wasn't creative leadership, but just leadership in general. Basically the message of it was like, you could, you can give them all the assignments, you can give them all of the work, you can try and give a vision, but if they know you don't care, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. So showing that love yeah. and, and it, it is really about relationships. When I've talked about the nine steps to becoming a creative director, the top one is relationships. That's absolutely. Yep. The and I would add, I've heard recently, and I just, it's one of those things that didn't surprise me because I've been living it for a long time. They say top leadership skill is empathy. Mm -hmm. To be able to feel what it's like to be that kid building a brick wall. Yeah. Why am I doing this? And to let them know you're building a cathedral with God and here's why and it matters. But, but it starts with empathy. Mm -hmm. And empathy may mean agreeing this sucks. Or it may mean, oh boy, Mike Hughes, he, he told me this one once, is, um, it is really hard being a creative. It is. We have so, so many defeats, and those those wins really keep us going. And so, what Mike uh, made sure to do was uh, he 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 wanted to give some little victories to all of his people, and he would sometimes just give them soft pitches on some easy peasy a client uh, because they just suffered a lot of defeat 
uh, the hands of a more brutal client. And it just, it, those, those little wins mean a lot to the creative. We work with a lot of cynics, but the way to get to their heart is with love and show them that you care. I think that's a, I guess my last question now that we're, we're kind of coming to an end here is like any last advice Beyond that, if, you know, the, just showing empathy and love. Any any last thing that you would give to others out there who are trying to be better creative leaders? What else should they try or do? Okay, here's a, you asked me about demotivating. Uh, these are easy peasy ones to do, but I've actually had creative directors do this on my watch and on me. Um, don't cherry pick assignments and do them yourself. That happens a lot. Uh, that just should be illegal. It should just be mm. no that cool job down and give it to that poor kid who just had five campaigns killed. Even if you think it's too big for him or her, shut up. Just put that brief down. Uh, the next thing to do is, is don't assign 50 teams to a single brief. Mm-hmm. Now this happens during new business, but I, and I, but I see why people do it. We got to win this thing. And I want as many brains as on this thing. Yeah. Maybe for pitches, uh, fine, a couple of teams on a brief, but uh, just because you're worried about a big client and you don't think somebody can do it, you can throw other teams on it. It's just, it's just simply says, I don't trust you. I don't trust you at all. Just like a uh, Hunger Games with creativity. <laughs> oh, it just, it's just terrible. Uh, I mean, I have this image of, uh, of 400 people on a rope in ancient Egypt pulling one of those big blocks. <laughs> That's what it feels like uh, when you're competing against your friends, um, down the hallway, ah, terrible. Yeah. Now they did this at Crispin with some success though. So I, I, you know, I could be wrong. Crispin, they had briefs on the wall and you came up and you ripped one off. Yeah, I'll do this one. And, and so I may or may not be right about this, but I I hated it personally I did myself. I did too. I, I don't think it's a good at practice. And to be honest, I mean, it finally, well, I think it kind of bit them in the butt as well because there were a lot of people out there like, I never want to work there because of that competitive spirit maybe it gets you some good ideas in the short run but it was not sustainable but for a while it was radioactively creative it really was i had a friend leave from gsdnm to go be a a creative director there and that's kind of a higher level which is even going to be tougher than being a junior thomas kimini told me a story about yes the sleeping at the office you just slept at the office when he worked at Crispin, yeah. he spent one night sleeping on top of a old Burger King uh, costume that was kind of fluffy. <laughs> that was underneath his desk at Crispin. And the deal was, what they told people at Crispin was, you're going to do the best work of your career here. And they did. They did. I think they could have made that, that model sustainable with uh, maybe it's pumping the brakes a little mm. bit, but they never did. They never did, and it just the wheels started to go like this. Yeah. Well, Luke, thank you so much. This has been such great advice. We've heard a lot of great things from uh, you know authenticity and transparency, and how to motivate and what demotivates creative teams. I think it's been super helpful. So thank you, thank you for sharing all this wonderful advice. And for those who have just you know met Luke here on the show, go out and get his book. Hey, Whipple, squeeze this. It's a great read. I highly recommend it. But tell us where else people can find you if they want to follow up and follow you and your career, your writing. HeyWhipple.com. It's a, it's a, I used to post all the time on that. There's many old posts. Some I'm very proud of, actually. But in my last years, I've not I've been writing the book more than the Hey, Whipple. But we, I just released a series of five videos with the authors of five other advertising books, Thomas Kimeney of Junior and uh, David Baldwin with uh, the Belief Economy. Nancy Vonk has two books. The one's called Pick Me, which is a staple at ad schools, and a, a newer title called Honey, or no, Darling, You Can't Do Both, hmm. which is something she heard from a creative director when she said, I'm glad, probably going to start a family. Hmm. So this is advice for women to ignore on the way up. That's her book. And then uh, good old Cameron Day, uh, his new new book uh, called um, uh, Chew With Your Mind Open. Uh, we did a book club and we just all got together and each episode is us talking, throwing questions, uh, but just giving uh, uh, questions to each author in turn. Uh, so you can find me there. Uh, that may be where I might want to concentrate. I don't know where I'm going to go next, but I am available to tell people out there, yeah, hire this old coot. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. I, I appreciate the chat. I think this is going to be great. We'll list those books out in the uh, in the show notes, if anyone's listening to this on a podcast, you can always go to realcreativeleadership.com on the show and 
and we'll list out all of those books so you can you can click through and find them. Again, we love all of you to uh, join us in the suggestions, uh, suggest a topic, share with your friends, whatever you like to do. Just help us get the word out on the on uh, real creative leadership. So we appreciate uh, all your listening. You can always find me at adamwmorgan.com. And then the team that produces this show, St- The Stoke Group, you can find them at The Stoke Group. If you need help with any agency scaling up your strategy, or your content, or your creative, they're, they're a great resource. So thanks again for listening to this, uh, this episode. Again, thanks, Luke, for being on the show. Classic uh, legend, and we're so happy to have you here. So thank you. My pleasure. All right, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Real Creative Leadership. I'm your host, Adam Morgan. This series is produced by The Stoke Group, a full-service digital marketing agency that specializes in content marketing, video, and interactive experiences. If you're looking for a partner to build a strategy and content that delivers, visit thestokegroup.com and connect today.